Hey, Dr. Cruz, thank you for coming on the podcast. I see you're outside getting your morning sunlight in. Absolutely. Um, you, yeah, it's pretty much a staple um, for you and like your practice. But can you tell me a little bit about your move down to El Salvador and kind of why you did that? Well, I mean, there's a lot of different reasons, but probably the number one reason as as we get older, um, we need more sun, not less sun. And that's a consequence of uh, some of the work that Doug Wallace has done on mitochondria. Um, the thing that mitochondria makes from metabolism is water and CO2. And it turns out every decade, we get less efficient in making water and CO2 from metabolism. Uh, the term for that is called heteroplasmy, and heteroplasmy actually defines what aging is. So <clears throat> when things are, how shall I say, ideal, uh, heteroplasmy goes up about 10% every decade. So when you understand this basic process, uh, you begin to realize that the stimulus that you need around you needs to be better. Like where I'm at right now, this is the 28th latitude, still pretty nice here, even though it's, you know, early September, uh, for people who say you're in New York or Toronto now, the weather here is probably right now better than it was for you around, uh, June 21st. Um, but El Salvador at the 13th North latitude is even better. Um, and it stays better throughout the, the whole year. So that I would say is the main reason. And plus, uh, there's opportunities for me to do some things in El Salvador that there probably wouldn't be uh, to do here in the States. Uh, and I'm exploring some of those. And um, I think those are probably the two main ones. Uh, mm -hmm. from in terms of heteroplasmy, you said that it like 10% goes up every year, I believe. So would you be able to like slow that curve down if you got sun like earlier on in your life. Then... Yeah, you, you can slow it down. It seems from the work that Wallace has done that we're most successful uh, slowing heteroplasmy down the first four decades of our life. That's assuming, obviously, that you got that message. Unfortunately, I didn't get that message until I was 40. Um, but um, the flip side of this argument is guys like you, even if you get the the uh, the information early, uh, you now live in a world that's no longer normalized. Like if you were to ask me, do I believe that Doug Wallace's 10% uh, rule of thumb for heteroplasmy is active in a 3G to 5G world? The answer is no, I don't believe it is. I think it's more like every five years. And I think this is the reason why we're seeing you know, chronic diseases show up in kids that are 20, 30, 40 years old. You know, it was unheard of when I was your age to see a kid with Alzheimer's disease, you know, begin in their 20s and 30s. Now, um, it's not uncommon to see, you know, early onset Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, you know, show up. Same thing true with, you know, ALS. Um, I mean, I'm seeing carotid strokes now. Um, just seeing things that I shouldn't see in 20 and 30 year olds. Do you think that's due to like EMF, like blue light or combination of both of those? I think it's due to a combination of people are, are now abusive with technology. They, they do not understand that there's a negative connotation to the use of technology. I'm not, a lot of people like to characterize me as like a, you know, anti-tech. I'm not really anti-tech. I'm like, I think you need to learn how to use tech appropriately. Uh, it turns out the tech that most people screw up is they don't know how to use the tech behind me, which is called the sun. And then the second big thing is the time that you cannot abuse technology is at night. Night is mm -hmm. when there needs to be an absence of light. Um, and I do think screen-based technology is a problem there. I think, you know, Netflix, Google, your computer, your cell phone, uh, these things are all designed to absolutely destroy you at night. And, I mean, you're a young guy. You know, most of your compatriots that are in their 20s and 30s, they spend their whole freaking night 
on the phone. I mean, mm -hmm. I see it every, every place I go. And I don't think that they realize what they're doing when they do this. You know, that's the reason why when I do a podcast, not that I try to be hyperbolic, but I actually try to tell people, I said, look, if the biggest epic fail in the world is being Steve Jobs and being uh, Paul Allen. I mean, think about the Apple and Microsoft gurus. Both of them died at six at fifty six, you know, of their own technology abuse. And you know, neither one of them. I think Steve Jobs actually knew it. I don't know if Paul Allen did. And there's a lesson there for what I would call OG big tap guys one point oh. Um, and I even think that you could put Gates in this because Gates was Allen's partner, but he was wise enough to get out of the tech game early and then flip to vaccines because there was no legal ramifications, you know, for that monopoly. Um, I think you just have to look at the examples in front of you and, and, and then put it together yourself because a lot of people, you know, have, especially who are young like you, who love to use tech or tech abusers, they get Stockholm syndrome. There, there's like, you know, there's no way that this could possibly be hurting me. And, you know, when you casually say to them, look, here's Andrew Marino's book called Going Somewhere. Read the congressional testimony that he and Becker gave to the federal government in the 1970s before, you know, tech was really here. Find out what they they talk to Congress about, and then realize this is now 50 years ago. Congress is known. The government is known. But they weren't going to change because they were retooling the economy from an industrial economy to an information technology. It's kind of like they're not going to stop doing what they're doing. So it becomes incumbent upon us, you know, the public who's alive in 2023, to realize, okay, what's the best way for us to use this so that we don't really harm ourselves. And I always I always think there's going to be you know a bit of risk in no matter what we choose to do. Uh your goal if you choose to accept it as a black swan minded contract is to figure out how to mitigate that risk and do it well. I mean, the first question you asked me on this podcast I think is a perfect way to mitigate uh, the risk, you know, try to get to a low latitude like in El Salvador and use technology there. I think if you you realize that early, I think I think you can do pretty well. The 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 one good thing that's happened with COVID is that I think a lot of people now realize they can do their jobs remotely. They don't need to be in any one spot. Uh, I think most of the reason that people stay in one spot has more to do with their wants, needs, and desires and beliefs around family and things like that. But I think even that's going by the wayside because I think when people get sick, ultimately, they begin to realize their whole life changes. Um, and if you're not good enough for yourself, who are you good for? I mean, to me, it's the ultimate, the ultimate fail to get a chronic Neolithic disease and then say, well, you know what, I'm just going to stay in Toronto because, you know, that's where my mom cooks ribs for me every Thursday. I mean, that, that, that logic makes no sense to me. In terms of sunlight, what is it about the sunlight that kind of organizes your brain to know like what time of day it is? For example, like people like Huberman, obviously you like went kind of in on him, but he always was preaching like morning sunlight. Um, and that was like one of the things that got me to start doing it. But obviously I know like not everything he says is perfect, but what is it specifically about like the sunlight that kind of tells your brain like what time it is and at night, like, I guess a, a, a second part to that question would be like this blue light at night, like those blue blocking glasses, do those, those do anything? Yeah. I mean, you, to answer the question, accurately it's pretty simple it's the super cosmetic nucleus is an optical lattice clock for sunlight so what does that mean it means that it takes all the frequencies that are in the light right now and comes up with a color temperature of the light the color temperature of sunlight diurnally changes from about i would say probably 1200 to 1600 kelvin at dawn all the way to about 12,000 kelvin at sunset and then radically it turns off 
that is what the atomic lattice in your supercosmetic nucleus and in your retina is designed uh, to, to watch. And that's how we actually tell time. There's another way we tell time at nighttime. Uh, it's a little bit different, and it has a lot to do with the Schumann resonance. But these two things work together. Um, when they work together, it basically tells you not only what time of the day it is, but it also tells you where the Earth is in relation to the sun. So you get an idea about what the month uh, is, and that tells you what season you should be in. And that sets uh, the biologic programs in you. So, for example, mammals, they change their their cell membranes from winter to summertime. Mo most people don't even know that. But all mammals do it. And when you were a little kid, you knew about it because when you went to the zoo and you saw the coats of the animals change, that's actually how it happens. Uh, in humans, one of the ways we know is that's, that's how our thyroid hormone changes, uh, fluctuations during the season. It has to do with light ad adaptation but through our eyes, but also through our skin. The problem is we're one mammal that doesn't allow our skin to really hit the sun that often because we're always wearing clothes, sunscreen, sunglasses, and things over our skin. But that's something that a wild animal that lives in Africa doesn't have to deal with. And for some reason, we think that we're somehow immune to the laws of evolution, you know, that we're somehow different than any other mammal on the planet. It turns out we're not. In fact, because we have a Ferrari engine in our head, uh, we're more subject to that. And we break those rules. And once you break those rules, then you inject what we call chaos into the system. Chaos goes by another word in medicine. It's called inflammation. Inflammation is a positive charge. Health is a negative charge. When you break this down fundamentally back to the physics, you actually see that really all circadian mismatches are is an injection of positive charge, you know, into the atomic lattice of cells. And when you have a positive charge in the atomic lattice of cells, it changes all the signaling that you can do with that light that Uberman, you know, taught you about. Uh, and it means that's how your clock doesn't work. It means that's how the molecular clocks in your gut or your skin or your eye or your heart or whatever organ system you want to talk about, that's how they become inaccurate. It turns out every morning when the sun rises, like it's doing right now behind me, that's the default state. That's how you reset the system. That is the reason why you always hear me tell people for 20 years that you want to make like the Sphinx. You know, get down, look to the east, all four extremities to the ground, because that actually resets the clock. It's just like taking, you know, your old Rolex watch and, and re fixing every day. I, I don't have a Apple iWatch like a lot of you guys do. I don't know how you reset that, you know, to the default state. I can tell you I wouldn't wear one, so that's the reason I don't know about it. But the bottom line is I'm sure that there's some default setting in that Apple iWatch that allows you to reboot, you know, the whole thing so that you can make it more accurate. And that is a function of pretty much all clocks um, that have ever been built in nature, whether it's artificial or not. Uh, they have to be accurate, and the accuracy is tied to their periodicity. Uh, what are all clocks and how should they be thought of? They are flow meters of entropy. And it turns out when you understand that a clock effectively is a flow meter of entropy, the people that live the longest are people who have clocks that are the most accurate, that um, can tell us about the flow meter of entropy so that we can make proper decisions around them. Because what's the goal of a long life? It's actually to maximize the dissipative structure in cells so that you can collect energy at a vibrational electronic state to keep the net negative charge up, get rid of the positive charge, uh, and begin to live your life you know, long. And that is functionally how Doug Wallace uh, would tell you if he synthesized all the stuff like I have, um, how you limit heteroplasmy. You have to make your clock, all your clocks in you, uh, extremely accurate 
by increasing their periodicity to make them optimize flow meters for entropy. When you talked about thyroid hormone being different, like in the different summer months versus like winter months, is that like an actual change in like how quickly your metabolism is burning yeah. fuel? Yep. Actually so, changes everything. Not only that, free T3 actually tells you uh, a ton. Before we had all the fancy tests we had for cardiovascular surgery, when we first started doing heart surgery and medicine, uh, T3 is what all cardiovascular surgeons use for how people would do after surgery. Turns out T3 is a, a really good predictive value for uh, what we call the metabolic scaling law. It's called Kleber's law uh, in terms of how things work in all mammals. But cardiovascular surgeons, the old school guys that I trained with, that's what we learned. And it turns out in my specialty in neurosurgery, same thing is true. You you have to have optimal T3 function to get good neurologic function. And when you kind of understand that, it, it kind of makes sense because what is your thyroid gland? It's like the gas pedal of metabolism. Uh, you should be able to step on the gas, come off the gas, and that is actually a seasonal ability. And it turns out people that have optimized T3 and T4 cycles are the people that do best, not only with cardiovascular surgery, but also with neurosurgery. People that have horrible you know, thyroid functions are going to have very wild uh, responses you know, to surgeries, which is another injection of chaos into the system. Um, and when you think about it, this from like an 80,000 foot view, thermodynamically, it should make total sense to you. The problem is most people don't think this way, you know, when they sit down and talk with their doctor. I can tell you most doctors don't think this way who have been trained in the last 40 years. But I can tell you the guys that that learned this stuff when I did, you know, 40 years ago, they did think like that. They no longer do. Speaking of doctors in general, like why are there doctors that claim like sunscreen is like what you need to be doing every time you go out in the sun and like avoiding sun? I think I saw some headline saying well, stop, something stop along right the lines. There for a minute. Stop right there for a minute. You ask the question, yeah. why do they do it? Because it's good business for a centralized doctor. If you block the sun, you create more customers. That is the whole goal of ophthalmology and dermatology. Now, let me let me give you a caveat on that, because when I say that, I know that sounds really bad. Uh, they don't know. They don't know the implications. Why? Because they never sat down to understand what blocking the sun really meant. It, meant, it means that more people are going to come in and be sick. That's mm -hmm. why I said to you, it's a good business model. But remember, who set the tone for all that in their training? Big Pharma did. Big Pharma knows that, and then they codify that in the curriculum that these doctors learn. It's incumbent upon those doctors at some point in their training to realize they've been fucking lied to. Now, mm -hmm. there's a, a, a pretty famous guy named Upton Sinclair that made a comment a long time ago. It's really hard to question something when your salary depends on it. That is the conundrum of centralized doctors today, Okay. That's not my conundrum anymore. When I was 40 years old, I was just like all those other doctors. Um, I, I believed and I was taught and learned and had all this big pharma stuff uploaded to my head. And I never questioned it until I was 40 years old. Then I began to question it. Then I became a real problem. Um, that's what decentralized doctors do. They begin to look at energy thermodynamically and go, wait a minute. Maybe the reason I can't get my patients any better is because they're blocking the sun or they're using light at night. Those two things are the fastest way to ruin the flow meters of entropy, which are the molecular clocks in their body. Could this be the reason why they're getting sick? And then when you start to reject everything that the big pharma uploaded into your brain and begin to try some of the stuff that we're talking about, magically you start to see people get better. And then you go, Hmm, this is interesting. It's actually the reason why I tell people when thieves come in and rob a pharmacy, do you ever notice that they lock all the opiates and uh, powerful drugs up in the cabinets, but they leave the sunscreen out open? 
the reason for that is because they want you to steal the sunscreen so that you'll go and use it because they know that that is the driver for you needing the prescriptions for all the stuff they got locked in the cabinet. And, you know, people laugh when they hear this. They, they think, dude, do you realize what you're saying? I'm like, yeah. I mean, look at, look at the story of the Sackler family and Oxycontin. Go look it up sometime. You know, most of you young people don't even know just how dastardly this was. Um, and that, that story, they're not the people that, that came up with the original block the sun issue, but they, that family knew that if you had patients that blocked the sun, that you become more addicted to Oxycontin. And that is the reason why they'd made some of the decisions as a family to basically take uh, um, a morphine that was only used at death and said, let's start using this in life and let's start using it earlier. Um, they're the perfect family. They're the perfect uh, centralized biologic principle to actually learn some of the thing that I teach people. Most people don't realize that from sunlight, natural sunlight, that you make beta endorphin. Beta endorphin is the opiate that the sun makes. And it has a very small effect when you compare it to something like Oxycontin. But what's the implication? Once you learn this, because you're not going to learn this in medical school, uh, you begin to realize that nature actually had made us to be addicted to the sun. That's the reason why we like to go out. It's the reason we like to go to the beach. It's the reason why we like to see waterfalls. It's the reason why we like to see pictures of the ocean or be close to a beach, because it actually gives us an opiate hit. Well, the problem is when you subtract that through sunglasses, clothing, or sunscreen, then you lose that quantized effect. And then guess what? You get become subject to the use of Percocet, Lortab, Oxycontin. Uh, you know, think about any rock and roller who's died. All of them are always up at night playing their songs. And the reason why they all use drugs, it's obvious. I mean, I, I actually find it hilarious when people talk about the opiate crisis, I mean, we've known about the opiate crisis for freaking 50 years. You know, it's all about light at night and no sun during the day. Um, those are the people who get these problems. And it's because of what's buried in that Palm C gene. And beta endorphin is the key. And the Sackler family is taking huge advantage of that. They are, they are just like the sunscreen manufacturers. and. Sunscreen is a gateway drug to big pharma. That's how you need to think about it. Sunglasses are a gateway drug to cardiovascular and, and neurologic diseases. You see, Ray-Ban's not going to tell you that when you go buy the sunglasses. They're going to assume you're a fucking idiot like everybody else does. I mean, that's what marketing is. It's legalized lying. The problem is, if you happen to be dating a girl that, you know, really looks nice in those sunglasses, they're going to sell you that idea. They're going to sell you the idea that, oh, if you get a sunburn, like you see my skin is red now because I've been in the sun pretty much the last 20 years of my life. They're going to sell you on the idea that that's not a good thing to do. And they're going to create through their partners a cadre of articles that makes you read Luke Lammy. And you asked me this foolish question because your question to me, some people would say, oh, it's a fair and reasonable question. I'm going to tell you it's a question that has no face validity. Why? Because you don't really know the totality of the literature. And that's a design of big pharma construction. That's what mm -hmm. I need you to know, because when you go back and look at the original stuff from, let's say, the first 50 years of the 20th century, You'll find the exact opposite in the literature, that actually proper solar exposure is actually keeps your morbidity and mortality from diseases down. In fact, that was just recapitulated in the literature in Sweden. And the reason why I always talk about this on podcast is the Swedes, when you understand medicine well, 
They do the best job of epidemiology of any country out there because they keep fabulous records. What did the last meta-analysis about sunlight actually say? When you block the sun, it's worse than smoking cigarettes. Try that one on for size. The next time somebody tells you that sunscreen is wise. I mean, I try to make this as clear as I can without hype, hype, uh, hyperbolic statements. You got to stop listening to fucking morons, okay? Anybody mm -hmm. who, who says that the sun is bad, nothing behind me is alive without the sun. That includes me. It is absolutely a preposterous statement for somebody to tell you that something that every single part of, of a living creature is optimized to for 4.6 billion years is somehow toxic for you. Mm -hmm. I don't, um, I, my, me, myself, like I go in the sun all the time, but I was just thinking of like a rebuttal that people might have that. Well, I just gave say, it like, to you. Cut, cut this I, snip out and use that as your marketing clip because guess what? I am sick and tired of people asking me this fucking question because it's so fucking obvious. That's the truth. I mean, okay. the sun is the key. Even the ancients, the, the Aztecs, the Incas, the Egyptians. Damn, the Egyptians, God was named after the sun. That mean this information for living creatures is blatantly obvious. But yet, mm -hmm. it just seems like in the last 50, 60 years with modern society that we all got the idea that wearing clothes, wearing sunscreen, and wearing sunglasses is a good idea and it has no negative connotations. That is the preposterous part. That, mm -hmm. is, that is absolutely what everybody should be asking me on a podcast, but guess what? Nobody does. Do you think there's any differences between people with like more fair skin versus people with darker skin as far as the level of sun they should be viewing, or is it just the same for both parties? Uh, well, no. I mean, the reason that you have different eye color and, and skin color has, again, to do a lot with Doug Wallace's work. We know that the people that have L0, L1, and L2, and L3 haplotypes tightly coupled, they tend to have darker skin. They tend to also be inside the tropics. When humans migrated 70,000 years ago and radiated over the planet, that's where we got all the different uncoupled haplotypes. That's where blue eyes came from. That's where our white skin came from. Those are the people that are furthest. Um, you know, I've been telling people this story a lot lately because I think it, it, it fits. Uh, people forget the, the, the homo, um, uh, I guess what I would call it species before us, Neanderthals, they were found in the Valley of Neanderthal, okay? That's at the 51st latitude. What people don't know about them is they had bigger eyes than us and they had bigger frontal lobes, 125 grams more tissue. But the interesting thing is we've never found any of their skeletons above the 51st latitude. Why? Because it turns out when your brain gets really big and you have big eyes, uh, you need the sun. And when you go above a certain level, you don't live there. What, what is the correlate to that story? It's actually the boreal forest in photosynthesis. If you go above this, the 59th, 60th latitude, you don't see trees anymore in the northern hemisphere. You, don't, you can't check this in the southern hemisphere. Why? Because we only have one continent. It's at the pole. You know, at that latitude, that's the southern ocean. So this is really a story of one pole on Earth. But the boreal far forest, if you look at the northern hemisphere, encircles the whole earth, but it stops. There's a hard stopper at the 60th latitude. What does that tell you? That not even photosynthesis works. If you've ever been to Scotland, if you've ever been to Iceland, and you see like the lava flows in Iceland, they're barren. But if you come down to El Salvador, you'll see that there's plant life all over it. Mm. Well, what's the story there? Nature is actually telling you her decentralized story. It's about light, water, and magnetism. The same thing is true in our skin color and our eyes. You know, it's not racial uh, to say that black people should be living inside the tropics because that's what they're fucking optimized for. That's actually what their vitamin D is optimized for. It's what their brain chemistry is optimized for. But through human civilization, society, and politics, uh, black people were sold by their own people to white people. And they radiated all over the planet. Uh, now you find Somalias that live in, in Toronto and Detroit. 
and does that inject chaos? More positive charge, less negative charge? Absolutely. Do they develop problems there that they don't have when they're in Somali? The answer is yes. Is the correlate to that also true? Yeah. Uh, white people who are Northern European uh, who lived at high latitudes, who had blonde hair and blue eyes, they got on boats and they wound up settling uh, another new world in Australia. They're not designed to be there either. So the flip side is true as well. The problem is very few people spend any time truly looking at Doug Wallace's work in mitochondrial biology and how it links to coupled and uncoupled haplotypes and how it links to skin color. Instead, we get tripped up on the stupid human ideas about, um, I guess I would call it sociology, psychology, and those things. And guess what happens? The biology uh, gets lost in the fray, and it gets so lost in the fray that sometimes it becomes mythology, and we focus on the wrong things. I'm that dude that doesn't allow people to do that, okay? I'm the guy that points out the fucking obvious, okay? Uh, and when you look at my science and you try to refute the points that I'm giving you, you magically find out when you look in the literature, you know, Jack's right. You know, there's there's something to this that that people with light skin, Fitzpatrick uh, one skin type and blue eyes are optimized for certain environments on this planet, certain ecosystems. And the thing is true for Kenyans or people from Nairobi who go all over the world and win, you know, marathons. There's a reason they are optimized to win marathons because they're optimized for one degree north latitude at 8,000 feet in the air. That means their skin is going to be as dark as all hell because they can absorb massive amounts of solar charge. And then when they leave that country and go anywhere else, they're the best endurance runners in the world. It's not, a, it's not magic. It's not even genetics. It's actually epigenetics. But the big pharma paradigm that's in power wants everybody to believe it's about DNA when the truth is it's really mostly about mitochondrial DNA, the other genome, the thermodynamic genome that powers the nuclear genome and tells it what to do. And when you really parse this out, if you really want to think about some of the other questions you'll ask me, this is the coolest part. Uh, to show you how time stamping happens in biology, most people don't even know that circadian biology occurs, the time stamping occurs in a post-translational nuclear genome event. So what does that mean in English? It means that the DNA already has to be translated for circadian biology to functionally work in time stamp. So when you understand that, it means most diseases, like 99.9% .9 of them, can be fixed when you optimize circadian biology, not when you're fucking around with somebody's nuclear genome. But that science, believe it or not, was given a Nobel Prize in 2017. But today, 2023, I'm still looked at the heretic. And the guys that are selling you the idea about using CRISPR and fixing your genome, you know, and using all kinds of crazy bullshit that people are now espousing, they're somehow cutting edge. They're not cutting edge. Those guys are like centralized shills selling you snake oil in 1890 on the corner of Broadway and 72nd Street. It's total fucking bullshit. Uh, the guys that are selling you the idea, doing this right now, being out during the, the morning, if you got to use technology to share the ideas like we're doing, do it outside in natural EMF so that you can optimize your mitochondrial biology so that you can go on other people's podcasts and rant and rave like I'm ranting and raving right now. After the sun goes down in the evening, is it best that you just eliminate all blue light after that point? Yes. Okay. And would you recommend for people that are like, hey, I don't want to remove all technology. I want to go on my phone a little bit. They would use blue light blockers and those have any effect whatsoever. Yeah, they have an effect, but they're not going to affect uh, the blue light that gets through your skin because, fortunately, as of 2017, we found out that melanopsin, the blue light detector, is not only in your skin, it's in your sub-Q fat, and it's also in your blood vessels. So, again, you, you just fucked up. You fucked up bad. Um, unless you're going out 
like a Muslim woman at night covering all your body with blue blockers on, then you, you've kind of, you know, just shit the bed, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. So you need to know that. But see, that's the trade off. Like, I'm not telling people that they can't do that. Um, but one of the things that I think my members just found out who came down to El Salvador, people don't understand how biology is supposed to work until they get to a place like El Salvador. El Salvador doesn't have daylight savings time. So the sun rose at, when I was there last, the last day, 547. It sets at 625. So you only have 30 minutes where it varies from, you know, December 21st to June 21st. So that means you have light stability. Here's the, the, the really interesting thing about it. At 630, literally it got dark in El Salvador. Like there's some people right now that are going to watch this who are in Toronto and go, dude, it's not even dark here, you know, at that time yet. Um, what people don't realize is that that darkness actually has a huge role to helping your biology. And the funny thing is the people that spent the, the two months with me down there realized that I didn't have a TV in the place that I stay in there. I had my computer, but my computer rarely went on after 630. Um, when you have no TV and you don't say have, you know, places all around you where you can go boom, boom all night. There's places like in El Salvador, you have that. It's a totally different life. You begin to realize that, dude, I'm supposed to be in bed at this time. When I'm supposed to do my boom, boom is on the beach, you know, the first hour of the next day. And you'll find out that down there, most people congregate and do things during the day. They're not doing them at night. Uh, where that changes, ironically, even in El Salvador, happens in beach communities that are set up for boom, boom, who bring the light at night, or in San Salvador, the capital city. But out where we are on the beaches, they actually live a circadian life. And the reason why this is an important uh, thing for like a guy like you to see, like I would tell everybody, go go to a place like El Salvador, because it's one of the few places where you have a beach community that actually still operates through circadian light mechanisms. You can't do that in L.A. You certainly can't do that on the beach in, in you know, New York, in Rockaway Beach or Jones Beach. It doesn't happen anywhere in Florida. Um, and the problem is, after doing this for like 100 years in the States, you get the idea, well, boom, boom, supposed to happen at the beaches at night. But you never get the experience that you have in a place like El Salvador where boom, boom is rare. And it gets dark at 630 every single day, no matter if it's December or June. And that light stability gets built into your life without you actually ever realizing it. And magically, people will come back from a week or two down there and go, you know, maybe it's just because I'm relaxed and I feel better. No, it's not. You know what it is? It's your circadian biology is optimized so that your clocks work the way they're supposed to work. That's the real answer. And the only way a young guy like you or young people listening to this podcast are ever going to have this experience in your lives is to go to a place like El Salvador. I guess so that's the third answer to the first question you gave me. What's another reason to go? It's actually to see what light stability is like in a place where there's truly dark at night. You know, to see what the sky sky looks like. I, I took a couple of my people to show them what the sky looked like. I said, see, you don't go have to go to Hawaii to see the stars or the full moon or what things look like. You know, because there's no ambient light around you from society. And when you see that for the first time, you begin to realize that's not how it is at home. In fact, it's never like that. And then you begin to realize maybe that's the reason why Jack always says that light is a ubiquitous problem. It's not, it's not that food's not a problem from the processed foods, but people don't realize since 1873, we've injected artificial light everywhere in our lives.
I'm actually in Costa Rica right now, so I took your advice and I've been trying to get as much sun as I can. And I can attest to the fact that 6.30 rolls around and the sun sets and then everyone just goes back and gets ready to surf in the morning, which is wildly different. Like then I was in college and like everyone's going out at 10 p.m. That's when Correct. the night starts. I'm and glad I was like the weird people. I was people. the weird dude who was. Sorry, Costa Rica is at the ninth latitude, so you are in a better latitude than I was. But I'm glad that you, you know, brought this up for your audience because that right there, that is one of the best ways for you to change the behavior of the people that will listen to this podcast because they're not having to listen to old Uncle Jack. They can listen listen to young Luke, who's actually at the ninth north latitude, and know what I'm telling you is actually accurate. And mm. I think what you need to do, Luke, is you need to encourage more of your listeners, more of your friends to take a trip like this with you so they can experience this themselves to see what it's really like for life to kind of turn off at 6.30, 7 o'clock, and then for it to turn on during the, the day and see how much fun you can have at the beach when the sun's out with all the people and then see how everybody's tan, see how everybody is in a good mood, see how nobody's, you know, stealing your shit, see how, you know, people generally like to go and break bread with each other and talk about their day of surfing or, you know, what they did on the beach. To me, that that's the story that I'd really like to get out there because I think when people become addicted back to nature, the things that most people want to talk to me about, like suicide, opiate crisis, obesity crisis, you know, diabetes, thyroid problems, infertility, you know, why guys want to be girls and why guys, you know, want to now join female sports, why all that stuff's happening. The answer fundamentally, when you parse it all out, it's because light is causing most of these problems. I think one of the other points you kind of like brought up and are hinting at is the fact that when you are like out late at night, you're normally engaging in some sort of alcohol. Obviously the light is toxic, but you're not doing stuff that's like actually like healthy for you that you would normally want to do, such as like going to the beach. I know I remember like in high school for me, I was just up late on my phone and that led me down to just like smoking weed at night and like all these like destructive habits. But it's like, if you have this structure where light is done at 6 p.m., you start getting tired by 9. And also, too, the thing is, you notice that if you're going up on your phone, that's why you're staying up late. Whereas the lights are sometimes just like all around you, just like out. So like you're just staying up. But it's really like only you who are choosing to stay up if you're going to go on your phone or whatnot. Well, so just think, remember the, like the said, cannabinoid system that you just talked about with weed actually is also yeah. optimized to the light and dark cycle and let's flip it around so we actually put some science behind what you just said because there is science okay. i mean when you drink alcohol at night what does alcohol fundamentally do to your mitochondria it actually decreases the amount of water and co2 they make that's actually the reason why you get a hangover the next day uh it turns out that sunlight optimizes how much water a mitochondria make and how much co2 it makes alcohol reverses that so who took advantage of that idea in the united states in the 1950s it was the mafia that's the reason why casinos have no outside lights and why they give you alcohol because they know if they can block you from the sun for as long as possible they don't have to stick you up with a gun they actually just reach into your pocket uh with the alcohol and the blue light from the machines and you actually give the money to them. You actually become like the allegory of the cave with Plato, where you're the slave, you're in the handcuffs, and even when they give you the opportunity to go outside, you refuse to go outside because you you think life inside the cave is great. That's actually a consequence of changing the dopamine firing levels in your frontal lobes. That's actually the basis of Stockholm Syndrome. But people don't, they don't want to talk about this science. They, they don't even realize that non-scientist criminals figured this shit out in the 1950s. And that is how accurate and honest this stuff is. And you just proved the point because you're a young guy 
who actually reversed the mafia experiment in Costa Rica. And you said it yourself, say, Jack, it's crazy. When I was doing boom, boom at night, I was smoking weed, drinking alcohol, hanging out with my friends, but always I was around some tech device that was driving this behavior. Well, guess what? This is not pseudoscience. This is actually really how it happens. Why? Because humans and all mammals are creatures of light. That's why we have this gene in us called POMC. POMC only gets translated from UV light. Well, how are you going to translate POMC when you got no UV light in your environment and you got a, 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 an abundance of blue? Actually, blue light turns off the POMC gene. So what effectively do you become in a blue light world? You become more like a previous evolutionary form. You become a moron. You become a, a monkey that doesn't talk. You become a, a monkey that gets a disease like autism. That's what autism is, severe autism. You don't talk. It's called regressive evolution. It's an atavistic effect. You know, when I have this discussion with mothers and parents of autistic kids, this really offends them. I'm like, I don't care if you're offended. My mouth's not a bakery. I'm telling you the truth. There's a reason that autism showed up uh, in, since 1940. And it's not magically some reason tied to neo-Darwinism or, or Darwin. It's actually the effect of light on our biology. And until people wake up and understand why there's pockets in the United States of where autism is really bad, you're going to find out that it's always linked to a, a massive amount of artificial light during the night and the day to people that affects their germ cells. And then their kids are born and they have these, you know, problems related to neural migration, you know, in the five senses and that hooks up to the thalamus. And when you realize that the main pathway that connects all this in the brain is the retinal hypothalamic pathway, you start to go, shit, I never actually put this all together. And that's what autism effectively is. It's actually a disconnection of the five senses to the thalamus. Why? Because neural migration doesn't happen. What controls neural migration in humans? Pretty simple, vitamin A and melanin. Oh, we're back to that story again. Amazing. You know, it's just like I want people to know that the answers to our problems are out there in decentralized science. You need to have the other issue that, that Luke just brought up here where he's beginning to realize that you get centralized problems that are published in papers when you start to do things that you're not supposed to be doing. He figured it out by going to Costa Rica and surfing. He's like, my life is different here than it is when I'm home. But that is a beautiful statement for people to resonate with. I hope, you know, when you market this clip, you highlight that because that needs to be heard over and over and over again because People think that something so simple as the light and dark cycle couldn't possibly cause Alzheimer's, couldn't possibly cause Parkinson's, couldn't possibly cause heart disease. And it turns out that's exactly how it happens. On your weight loss journey, I know you were like pretty overweight and then you lost a lot of weight. So I was wondering, does, was there any like, dietary changes that you made and um, exercise or was it strictly based on like your light diet pretty much? Well, it was, it was a combination of things. The first thing that I did, if you think about what I told you about light before, that you have to add net negative charge. So what happened in my diet? I said, okay, what's the most common net negative thing in a diet that you can eat? It's seafood. Why? Because everything that's in the ocean is surrounded by a sea of electrons. And when you understand how light works, it's the photoelectric effect. You know, that crazy guy with the hair, 1922 uh, Nobel Prize, Einstein. You can't absorb light without electrons. So the first change that I made was adding more electrons to my template. That's kind of what my book, the EpiPaleo RX, teaches you when you buy it on Amazon and read it. The second big thing was adding light stability to my life. So I did that. The third thing that really injected uh, significant weight loss once it stalled was cold thermogenesis because cold thermogenesis allows you to stimulate 
the subcutaneous and visceral fat around your organs to come to mitochondria, be broken down into water and uh, CO2. So those were the, the main impetuses. Um, people so would have... you say that like most people that are obese, it's fundamentally not a problem of what they're eating and it's more so oh, other factors? No, I mean, it's obvious that it's not. I mean, Luke, if you want me to go through the exercise with you that I go through in a lot of podcasts, we'll do it right now to prove it to you. I know that calories in, calories out is the dominant paradigm that everybody believes because you hear it all the time. Okay. Yeah. So let, let's explain this to you. When you were, I don't know, seven years old and you had a skateboard and you fell off the skateboard and twisted your ankle, did the ankle get bigger or smaller? Bigger. Right. So it got bigger since you had an injury, you lost energy. Okay. Um, let's talk about a heart. Say if you're an old guy in New York City and you get uh, heart failure, when you get heart failure, when you go to Mount Sinai Hospital to get checked out and they do a chest x-ray on you, is your heart bigger or smaller if you have heart failure? I'm guessing bigger. It's bigger. So now let's forget about the biology stuff. Let's go to something that is not alive. Let's go to the sun. When a star dies, does it get bigger or smaller? Smaller. No, it gets bigger. Ultimately, okay. it gets bigger first. So hmm. what happens? What did I just do with you? I just gave you the thermodynamic story that something gets bigger when it loses energy. Is that the paradigm that's calories in, calories out? The answer is no, because they think you have to eat more to get bigger. It turns out it's exactly the opposite. You actually get is it bigger just an inflammation thing? thermodynamically inefficient. So what does that tell you? It tells you that in mammals with mitochondria, it means that their mitochondrial engines are not as efficient at making water and CO2. That's the story. And what controls that? It turns out it's melatonin. And melatonin controls the change programs on top of gene apoptosis. What is melatonin made of? It's made out of an aromatic amino acid that absorbs what? 200 to 400 nanometer light. Oh, we're back to the UV story. We're back to electrons. All of a sudden you start going, maybe Dr. Cruz isn't as crazy as we all thought. Maybe mm. the way we're thinking about this is completely wrong. And this is the reason why we've got a real obesity crisis because the light that we invented in 1893, or actually 1874, but was codified by the change in Tesla's power grid, that light brought us all inside. I mean, look at you and me, perfect example. You're inside now, and I'm mad at you about that at the ninth latitude. <laughs> I'm at the 28th latitude, and I'm outside. What am I trying yeah. to tell you? Because you're recording me on the podcast, you got to be inside to control this, that, and the other thing. Um, mm -hmm. Technology brings us inside. We're designed yeah. to be outside. Like the Sphinx yeah. was not built inside the Louvre. It was put at the 28th latitude in the middle of the Sahara Desert for a reason, okay? And it turns out that uh, electronics over photonics is a modern belief. It turns out that photonics over electronics is the ancient belief. And that's the belief that your biology is built around, and that's what I need you to understand. And the reason why people have the fundamental flaw in their thinking that calories in and calories out matter is because they're living in an electronic world. That's how you build that belief, but it's not true. It's fundamentally not true. And, and to prove it even further, I like to take, tell the scientists that'll listen to this podcast that um, calories, when you look at in physics carefully, calories can only be used as a unit of measure in a closed thermodynamic system. Luke, do you think that me and you are a closed thermodynamic system? Or are we designed to be open to the environment? Open so, to the environment. Again, why would you ever talk about calories when you're dealing with open dynamic systems? See, I can, I can reason with you on the common sense way, which is why I told you about your skateboard and the heart and the star. But then I can take it to a strict science thing, why it's idiotic for anybody to believe it's about calories in, calories out. Why? Because nothing that eats is a closed thermodynamic system at all. I heard you mention something kind of similar, I think, to that, where 
a lot of the, or not a lot, but all the studies that are being done on like rats and mice and stuff are being done like under blue light. So a lot of the evidence and like research is being done on mammals that are not in their natural environment. So do you kind of believe that a lot of those studies are just like can be thrown out the window and they're just yeah. not accurate? Yeah, I mean, there, there'll be things in those studies that you can glean that'll be half truths. But the problem is, and I made this case to Uberman when I did the podcast with him and Rick, that um, their friend, Eddie Chang, who's a neurosurgeon, said that 50% of the literature is toast and the implications that are incalculable. I said it's 99% for this reason. Why? Because every single study done by modern centralized science since, I'm going to tell you, 1900 has been done under blue light. I mean, the, the, the guys that I like to highlight, uh, guys like Western A. Price, you know, you read his book about Western diets and civilization. One of the things that you'll notice in all of his pictures, because you remember, he made the same mistake centralized science did, is that, oh, these guys were eating, you know, native diets. What every single picture that he showed is somebody outside, you know, in the sun. He, he doesn't show them in a lunchroom in PS11 in New York City, you know, under artificial incandescent or LED bulbs. And when I made this point in 2016, when I did my Vermont webinar to the WAP people, you should have seen their heads explode because it's even there. Even when people try to make it about food, the story of light still shows up. The problem is you have to see it. And when I like to take it even further, I like to tell people that food is nothing more than an electromagnetic barcode of where the sun is in relation to the earth. And when you actually begin to think about food like that, then you begin to realize, holy shit, maybe this haplotype thing in mitochondria is related to, you know, what the electromagnetic barcode is in food. And it turns out it is. And what happens when that electromagnetic barcode doesn't yoke with where you are on the planet? Oh, guess what? That's another way for you to inject chaos or inflammation into the system. And, you know, when I first said this publicly in 2011 at the Paleo FX event to a Harvard trained anesthesiologist named Emily Deans, who I still make fun of to this day, um, I told her that certain time down the road, it would be shown in the literature that when you eat something that's not designed for the environment you're in, it would lead to molecular chaos. Well, the Nobel Prize was given for it in 2017. Now we have numerous amounts of studies on mice and rats that show when you feed them things they're not supposed to eat that are supposedly healthy by the paradigm, they magically get the same disease as we get. And most people don't realize the reason for that has to do with the electron density in that food. But the real big one is the number or, or isotopic variation of deuterium versus hydrogen which is exactly what the sun does. The sun parses electrons and protons. And it turns out all electrons are the same in the, in the world, in the cosmos, but not all protons are the same. Protons come in three different flavors. And it turns out that the electromagnetic barcode in food has a different isotopic variation. Then it gets even more crazy when you find out that water also has a different isotopic variation depending where you are on the planet. So if you live at the top of the world where the boreal forest is, you're going to have low deuterium in your water. If you live down where you are now in the ninth degree latitude, you're going to have more deuterium in it. Why? Because the sun is so strong there, it can offset the higher deuterium content, not only in the water, but also in the food that's created, which is predominantly carbohydrates. I don't have to convince you that mangoes and papayas are growing outside your window down there. You know, but they, those things do not grow in Boston on December 31st, even though they're available in Whole Foods in Boston on that day. And the problem is we don't realize that supposedly eating a health food is just like eating a Krispy Kreme donut at the ninth north latitude. Exactly mm. the same problem. Uh, but what do we do? We put labels on it. Oh, well, this is processed food. Oh, they have seed oils in it. Most of the seed oil idiots that are on Twitter don't even realize the real problem with seed oils, they're deuterium bombs, you know, and the, the problem I have is when you allow people to continue to make half truths, so both on Twitter, in the literature, in centralized science, it makes my job harder for people to get to the truth. Okay. 
that's the real problem. And this is the reason why people look at me as a pain in the ass or, you know, a guy that they don't want to have on the podcast, because look, I tell you the truth. And I tell you that it's harder. The, the real science of why this stuff happens is harder. And I don't want you blaming food for what light caused. Okay. Light is the fundamental cause of most of these problems. And until you, people get through their thick little heads, that the stronger light is, is linked to the deuterium content in water and food, that's the real processed food problem. Then you go from there. And then when you really scale this back as a young guy like you, and you think about all these fat people out there that are getting told to eat keto snacks that are made inside of someone's warehouse in Denver, Colorado, you go, what does it matter what your ketone levels are if you're basically mainlining deuterium in and you live in, I don't know, Toronto or New York? You know, and then they go, well, I ate all the food that the keto experts, you know, told me to eat and it still doesn't work. Yeah. One of the things I was thinking about was just like, Tonight's like the first night of the NFL season and a lot of the athletes when they are like practicing and training throughout the week, they're pretty much, I mean, obviously sometimes outside, but a lot of times like the lifting they were doing was inside and then they go and they play at like 8.30 Eastern time normally, which is a time that you would probably be asleep if the lights weren't there. So do you think that as a factor in like a lot of the injuries and I don't know, just like CTE maybe or some yeah. of the other problems I'll, that they're I'll having. I'll give you a couple examples. On a, on a podcast not that long ago, I forget whose podcast it was. Oh, I, I remember. I did a podcast with a guy named Chris. He's a, a trainer in Nashville. Okay. He trains young kids. And I actually told him, because when we did the podcast, it was before the NFL draft came out. And I told him there was a wide receiver from Ohio State who missed a whole year of college football because of hamstring problems. Uh, dark skin guy, not totally dark, but uh, African American. It's called uh, Jackson Enigma uh, from Ohio State. I said, if this guy gets drafted by a high latitude team, expect him to have problems. And I gave him the example of his former Ohio State player, Marshawn Lattimore, who plays for the Saints. Same issue. They missed a whole year for the same problem. Lattimore has done pretty well. Well, JNB got drafted by Seattle. I think it was 21st, 22nd pick this year. He's already out. He's going to miss the first four games of the year. So it's continued on. Now, to get to your question about CT, I'll give you an example of a guy, a uh, uh, middle linebacker for Indianapolis Colts, uh, Darius Leonard, drafted in the second round, small school guy that from South Carolina State who's absolutely – you know, hit it in the first couple of years of the league. He has been constantly hurt, you know, since I, I guess the last a year and a half, two years after he signed his big deal. He got a concussion last year in um, he had practice with, I think it was the Patriots or somebody this uh, off season. He got hit again. He's still mm -hmm. in concussion protocol for the last two and a half, three weeks. The season starts what? couple of days for the Colts. This guy has been constantly hurt, even though they've paid him. Uh, he also has mental issues. Like if you go in and follow him up, he'll tell you that he's had problems off and on with mental issues. This guy is perfectly set up to get CTE. And the reason is, if you look at his skin, he's, he's, he's as dark as the guys that come from Nairobi. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he's living in Indianapolis, which is not a great latitude. It's also a 5G city. He plays inside a dome, you know, for the first four or five years of his life. Um, he's had previous injuries, but remember, he went to a small school in the sun that played an outside stadium. Uh, now he's 27, 28 years old. And what do you start seeing? You're starting to see the effect of multiple issues add up of these circadian mismatches. And he's not able to get on the field uh, to play. And remember, what is ultimately playing football? It's just like exercise. It's the same thing that I tell uh, people, Luke, that when you're really sick and you have mitochondrial disease, you don't want to over-exercise. Because when you do that, what are you doing? You're stressing the system. 
So what effectively is the lesson from all these NFL guys? That when you have mitochondrial damage at some level in your system, doing extreme exercise is about the stupidest thing you could ever do. Why? Because the way we work thermodynamically, we are, um, we're only as strong as our weakest link. And when it comes to Darius Leonard, his weakest link right now is his mitochondria in his head. It gets manifested in other parts of his body. So one of the reasons why he missed a lot of time, I don't want to get into this, but it's tied to this story. He had back surgery. He actually hurt his back when Derrick Henry hit him, I think, week four, like two years ago. That's when he first hurt his back. And then right after he hurt his back, he hurt his ankle. And everybody in the Colts thought, oh, well, it was the ankle injury that was causing the problem. And after the season, they did an MRI on him and found out that he had a disc herniation that was causing the problem in his leg. So why do I, I mention this to you? The head problem led to the back problem through the nerves. And people don't put all this together. Well, now he's had two back surgeries. Remember, he had the first back surgery that failed. He came back to play last year, again, ironically, against the Titans. His own guy hit him on a goal line where he's trying to tackle Derrick Henry. And his own guy gave him a concussion during that. And he even said after the game, he goes, I shouldn't have been on the field because I realized everybody around me was operating at a much faster level than I was. What is he telling you? His time perception because of this problem was altered. And he realized it, but yet he still went out there. Why? Because he was the captain of the team. He was the guy that was supposed to be the leader. In other words, his body could not perform because the mitochondria in his brain weren't allowing him the sensing time on a proper level. What's happened to him? One thing is cascaded to another, to the another, to another. What am I trying to explain to you? Because you asked me a great question, and I've never really gone into this with, you know, what I see in patients. Because this is, these are the patients that I take care of, professional athletes. Why do they come to me after their careers are over? Because of what I just explained to you. I can explain to them how one thing leads to another and how we have to put things together after they've fallen apart. And this is the reason why guys in the NFL, guys in Major League Baseball keep getting hurt over and over again. Like Jason DeGrom, who used to play for the Mets, they traded him to the Rangers. He's still injured. He's still not playing for the Rangers. Uh, once you get mitochondrial damage at some level, you lose your ability to be an elite athlete, even though you can look the part. You will not be able to do the things that you used to be able to do. And people don't understand that. They don't understand how the thermodynamics of the colony of mitochondria in your body operates. And it's most obvious in NFL players and NHL players who get concussions because when that supercosmetic nucleus doesn't work, your ability to tell time everywhere in your body is off. And when you can't tell time, you wind up with you know mismatched diseases that's the reason why you get more injured over time because your muscle skeletal system doesn't react the way it should uh and and you wrongly think when you listen to you know several of the exercise gurus out there that going in and exercising in the gym and having a body like it looks great you're going to do fine when it turns out the guy who's really going to help you the most is a guy like urban the who brings you outside or a guy like luke lammy says hey why don't you come hang out with me at the beach at the ninth latitude and let's surf. Mm. That's actually how you get yourself back to shape. The, the stupidest thing you could do is going into a blue light gym, lifting weights, you know, with some of the meatheads in the carnivore world, you know, telling you that if you just uh, eat meat and stay away from, I don't know, dairy and vegetables, that, you know, you can get back what you lost, Darius Leonard. The answer is no. You'll, you'll have a great looking body, but as soon as you step on the field, you'll realize you don't belong on that field. In your opinion, do carbs play a role in like mitochondrial function at all? Yes. You, so, there's times where you need carbohydrates. That's generally... Would that be determined cycle. by where you're living? What's that? Would the amount of carbohydrates vary by where you're living? For example, like there's more fruits available where I am than where I grew up in Connecticut probably. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, I would tell you that uh, there's a reason that there's more carbohydrates at the ninth latitude. It has to do with the sun. And guess mm -hmm. what? Are you able to handle that? Yes. But Luke, if you continue to live your life inside that room with the curtains drawn, the answer is no. I'm <laughs> That's what I'm trying to make the point for the audience. Yeah. Okay. I'm not trying to make the point for you. I'm trying to explain to you that that's how this works. You need to have skin in the game. Your eyes need to be in the game. Your brain needs to be in the game. The point I just tried to make you with Darius Leonard, he's never in the game anymore. He's always inside. He's, he's got a, a iPad with a, a playbook on. He, he plays his game inside a fucking dome in Indianapolis at high latitude during the wintertime. Go figure. And he wonders why he's having problems. And then he's fueling himself with things that are not optimized, that don't even grow in Indianapolis, certainly are not going to grow in the gym that he's working on. Right? He's not getting told any good news. And then the Indianapolis Colts fans keep wondering why this guy's falling apart. I, I sit back and I'm, I, I mentioned to one of my, uh, my clients who's a big Colts fan, I said, I think his career is over. He's got friends. He's got friends on the team that also have a problem. Jelani Woods, their tight end, just tore his hamstring. Another big black guy, dark skin, who has been struggling. Not, and the guy is uber talented. But I hope for Jelani Woods he gets the message. He needs to go to a different team that doesn't play inside. Um, I'm just going to tell you that the story of mitochondrial biology is all around you, but you have to look at it. You have to realize it's not a story of skin color. It's not a story of genetics. It's not a story of race. It's actually a thermodynamic story of dissipative structures and cells. And until you get that message loud and clear, you're going to think about podcasts like this and guys like me in a light that's not proper. And then you're still going to continue to be dazzled by guys like Uberman, who gives you half-truths. And you go, this is really interesting, Andrew. But he can't sit down and have a cogent argument with you about why it's true. And I can sit down here with you all day long and explain things to you why. Because the framework that I'm in is 100% decentralized. Because that's what nature is. Andrew's mm -hmm. in a framework that is 100% centralized at Stanford University. That doesn't mean he's not going to trip over an occasional truth, because he does. He does it all the time. And he does a good job parsing out centralized science. What he does a horrible job out is pointing out the pitfalls of centralized science, because he doesn't understand. Them. That was part of the reason Rick Rubin invited him and me on the podcast, so that I'd show him some of those pitfalls. In fact, you parroted some of them here when you, you mentioned some of the things that I said to him, I said, how can you believe anything about right, mice and rats or nocturnal mammals are studying inside a blue light thing, but yet pretty much everything you talk about on your podcast only has proof from that experimental model. Hello? Uh, one of the last questions I wanted to ask you about was just grounding in general. I think I've heard like it has like negative ions. So is that the benefit? to grounding and do you tell your patients to like ground every day? Yeah, I tell people to ground all the time, but it's not negative ions. That's, that's a half truth. I'm going to give it to you okay. so you understand it. <laughs> when the sun sends its light out, it's a cathode ray. The planets are anodes. Anytime a cathode ray hits an anode, it creates free electrons on the surface. Okay. We happen mm -hmm. to be the only primate on the planet that has ecrine glands. Like if you touch my hands right now and my skin, my feet, you'd see I'm sweating. Okay? Mm -hmm. Other primates don't have what we have. We crying glands are a super natural ability of humans so that when we walk across the tectonic plates behind us, we get free electrons without having to eat our electrons. This helps augment our mitochondrial capacity. Remember what I told you before, that electrons allow you to absorb more light. So any way you can get free electrons is a winning story. Even the ancient Egyptians knew that because that's the reason why they put the Sphinx in at the 28th latitude, looking at the sun, all four extremities down. They knew there was a benefit to being grounded. And it turns out the benefit to grounding is actually you collect free electrons 
when you have a good connection to Earth. Uh, it even turns out that in places like you are now in in Costa Rica and El Salvador, um, there is a higher net negative charge in the ground there because remember the land bridge between North and South America is made out of volcanoes. So that means there's more electrons per unit uh, density there than there is in Connecticut where you're from. So when you walk on the black sand beach and you're in the sun, dude, you're, co you're collecting more electrons than you can say then, I don't know, in mystic Connecticut on the beach yeah. there at the same time. So that's the reason why grounding makes sense. Grounding also is highly anti-inflammatory for the reasons I said to you earlier in the podcast, because anytime you assimilate net negative charges, it reduces the positive charges. Sickness is all about positive charge. Health is all about negative charge. But remember, negative charge is the only way you can absorb light. It's the only way. You know, that's not my rule. That's nature's rule through the photoelectric effect. So when you understand grounding, grounding is one of the things that everybody should be doing. The problem is, like, when you go back to Connecticut, say, say you're standing right next to Trinity University in Hartford, and you ground on the grass there, you're probably not getting the effect because they've got power lines that are right next to the university, you know, that run all over Hartford um, that limit your ability to do that because of jump conduction. Same thing mm -hmm. is true in New York City. Same thing is true in Boston. So when a guy like you migrates out of the 44th latitude and goes to the ninth latitude and you're surfing, holding your board, just standing there talking to some really cool surfer dudes or some good-looking surfer chicks, you are getting a benefit just by standing there, holding your board, talking to them. It's a better effect than you're going to get doing boom, boom at night at 10 o'clock on your phone doing Tinder. 100%. Thank you, Dr. Jack. I feel like in general, just the idea is to help people like get healthier. And I think the only way you can kind of get that to start moving in a different direction is to get people to actually feel that difference to like come down to the spot. So I think it was a good idea for you to try to bring some people down and all your expertise. I appreciate it. No problem. Anytime. Hopefully this, uh, you know, changes at least one or two people's lives and, and change the way they think about things because ultimately that's why I do podcasts. I do it, you know, because I really believe we don't need 7 billion people in the world to change. We just need about 70 to a hundred thousand to get, the story right and then hopefully they'll wise up and realize that there's arcs being built in other places in the world and right now the best arc that i see isn't the united states it's el salvador you got a government mm -hmm. and a president down there that is looking to collect the right animals um in the world and he's returning freedom to those animals that's not happening in our country anymore mm -hmm. that's a good point thank you dr jack all right, take care.